Today I'm going to be talking about Tezos X. Uh, I'll get to the next slide of what it is. But uh, what it does is that it opens a new frontier for all developers. Uh, so what is Tezos X? So Tezos X is a proposal, and that's important to understand. Um, you know, I, Tezos does decentralized governance. We actually have decentralized governance. It's going to um, dozens of upgrades now, or sorry, over a dozen upgrades, and all of them have been voted by um, the stakeholders of the chain. You know, it doesn't evolve by hard fork. It doesn't evolve by a centralized team, you know, dictating what should happen. Um, it's all decentralized. And so Tezos X is a proposal for um, Tezos. So what is it? Um, well, first, it's modulitic. I'm not a fan of the neologism, but it says it. Um, it's both modular in approach, so it's a modular design, but you get all the benefits of having a monolithic uh, approach, all the composability. So you keep the, perf you know, you keep the performance of being modular, uh, but you keep the composability of being monolithic. You get the best of both worlds. You keep the interoperability. And what do you get in the end? Well, the goal is to get something that's almost like a cloud-like backend, where any application you, you, know, you could build on a cloud, you could just go and get your um, cloud account and, and run your software. Um, the chain, if it's just so performant and so cheap, you can just treat it as a cloud. And that's, that's the goal. That's where we want to go with um, Tezos X. So, um, how does this work? Um, what are the different layers? How is it uh, monolithic? So you start with a platform, and the platform on the L1, that's your base. That's where you have your governance for deciding what's going to happen, for deciding how the chain should evolve. That's super important. I don't think you can have a decentralized chain today without on-chain governance. You know, otherwise, what you have is a, uh, is a, you know, like is a, is a software company miscarrying as like a, uh, a ledger, and it's not a good foundation. You have your consensus, super important. At the end of the day, why do we have blockchains? You know, we have blockchains because we want to have uh, a record, a ledger, and you need to have consensus to record transactions. Um, staking, the so staking is what uh, allows the consensus. The settlement, um, and you need to have fast finality if you want to have really good settlement guarantees. Uh, and potentially bridging also with other ecosystems because you know, there are now hundreds of blockchains out there, um, and bridging has become quite important. On top of that, you build a data availability layer. So data availability layer, of course, um, there's been a lot of hype around them with many people different, like building different type of data availability layers. You've seen them with Celestia. You've seen them with like the blobs in Ethereum and you know, the problems of dank sharding. So we have a data availability layer on Tezos. You can try it today. Um, it's currently being, uh, it's currently optional for the, for the validators of, uh, of Tezos to run it, but it's becoming a full part of the protocol very soon, and it's based on you know, the full sharded data availability sampling uh, approach. You can build on top of that the low latency sequencers. I've given a lot of talks on what sequencers can do. Uh, the long and short of it is, if you look today at sequencers, I think the term has been bastardized because a lot of people use them as a crutch for centralization. You know, you'll, they, they'll run a roll-up. They'll say, like, oh, come in. You know, go on chain. Go on chain. But you're not going on chain at all. You're going on some corporate company's private database, and their sequencer does everything. You know, it controls the security. It controls your asset. It can steal your asset. It can do everything. So those are not the sequencer we're talking about. We're talking about very, very narrow sequencers that do one thing and one thing only, which is decide on the order of the transaction so that you can get confirmations very, very fast, so that in less than a second, you know that your transaction is going to be sequenced, is going to be integrated in the chain, and they have no other powers than that. Um, they can cannot steal money. They cannot control the security of the chain. So um, be wary. There's a lot of L2 solutions, which are just private databases masquerading as L2s. That's not what we're talking about here. Then you have a smart roll-up engine. So we started um, with a Mumbai upgrade in Tezos last year uh, with Wasm. So anything that you can compile to Wasm and many languages compiled to Wasm, you know, assembly script, Rust, Anything that compiles to Wasm today, you can run as a smart rollup on Tezos, but we're adding more. So we're adding uh, RISC-V support, which I think is an even broader compilation target than uh, Wasm. There was a while back, if you follow the trends and the vibes a little bit, where the crypto industry was all about Wasm. Now it's like shifting more towards um, RISC-V. And you know, we, we, we're following this. It's not, just because, you know, it's not just because of hype. There are a lot of benefits to this architecture. Uh, fraud proofs, obviously, you know, we wouldn't run any of this without fraud proofs. I think it's a complete travesty when people are doing L2s and they don't have fraud proofs. Uh, and also zero knowledge proofs. Love zero knowledge. Um, you know, I, I wrote a blog post in 2017. I encourage you to check it out. It like, has held really, really well on um, how you could build the key rollups essentially to scale. 
uh, uh, and to uh, and to provide uh, a lot of throughput. I think it holds to this day, but the cost of the cost of decay is still very very high. I think it's fallen to the point where if all you're doing is just like regular transactions, you're going to be fine, uh, even like some smart contracts. But if you want to build a true cloud light backend where you can just run any application, where you can compile it, and you don't have to like gas optimize everything, then we're not quite there yet. But I think it'll be a drop in replacement if and when we get there. Runtimes, that's, you know, what do you build on top of that? So, you know, Mikkelsen is the original runtime on, you know, for, for Tezos. It's a VM. It's an awesome VM. If you want to do formal verification of your contract, it's super important. But what happened? Well, the first thing is, like, people really don't like doing formal verification. It's very, very time consuming. And second, a lot of applications have been quite centralized. People have been happy having centralized applications. So if your application is centralized and you have keys where you can upgrade your contract, and if formal verification is still very time consuming, um, then maybe you're not going to bother. But I think that's changing. One is because AI is making formal verification much more automatable now. Um, the long and short of it is that um, formal verification is tedious, but not intellectually very complex. Um, it's just that you really need to like, slog through a lot of, uh, of effort to do it. That can be automated. It is being automated. And the second thing is, like, I think over time, we're going to see things change out. Um, systems which are centralized are more brittle. The keys get stolen. Um, you know, they get, um, they get fines. Um, they have to comply. Whereas systems which are actually decentralized are more useful. So I think we'll see some of that. But for now, uh, the EVM is also a very, very popular uh, uh, system. And we've built on top of Tezos Etherlink, which is a layer two solution. It's 100% um, Ethereum compatible. You can use it today. It's not you know, properly launch launched, but it's on mainnet. Um, it works, so try it out. Um, and it's fully EVM compatible. Lots of demand for EVM, of course, in, uh, in our industry. But you can go much, much, much beyond that. And I'll talk about that, um, including, for example, JavaScript as a runtime. What do you build on top of that? Languages. So JavaScript, it's a language in itself, so it can be a VM in a language. But languages that uh, we've known and love in the Tizzle ecosystem, like LIGO, SmartPy, and also more popular languages out there, um, like Solidity, a little, bit, a little bit more popular, and massively more popular languages, like Python, Java. Those have orders of magnitude more developers than any of our you know, blockchain uh, uh, programming languages. And on top of that, what do you build? Uh, great applications in the DeFi space, gaming space, in art. So many possibilities. Um, so what are the key deliveries of this Tezos X thing? I went a little bit through the stack. Uh, interoperability is a huge factor. And so I've mentioned you know, support for Solidity, which we introduced now on Tezos via Etherlink. But Solidity is small. You're talking about thousands of developers. Uh, Python, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp. Those have millions, tens of millions of developers. They have libraries. They have these deep tool chains, these deep ecosystems. And despite you know, the billion that have been spent uh, trying to make Ethereum work and trying to make Solidity work, like the, this ecosystem of Python and JavaScript has had way more, way more development uh, added, way more support. Um, integration, uh, inter so interoperability means interoperability in terms of code. You want to be able to reuse those libraries. You want to be able to reuse this human capital that exists out there. But it also can mean integration with other chains, but also non-blockchain system. Now, what powers this interoperability is performance. I would say a lot of early languages, a lot of early VM like Mikkelsen are very, very concerned with performance because blockchains were extremely uh, throughput. Constraint. You couldn't do all that much. And so your language had to be like really tailor fit to doing smart contracts and, and, and doing these operations. But if you, can com you know, if you want to be able to just compile some code and run it and not have to worry too much about performance, then you need to have a lot of performance in your back end. So the target is a million um, transactions per second TP, uh, throughput. We've demonstrated that already. So last year um, at TestDev, the, the, the Test Developer Conference, we demonstrated 1 million transactions per second on chain, but that was in parallel across 1,000 rollups. So that's a modular approach. The modulistic approach is we want 1 million TPS in a single rollup with subsequent latency and less than 10 second finality. So that's um, the key deliverable for Tezos X. Finally, composability, no fragmentation. You know, no one wants to be jumping between 10 different rollups, uh, moving their assets around their bridges. Um, no one wants to uh, have to decide where they're going to be their contract, because if I build my contract here, it's not going to be able to access this other ecosystem. And so you want the flexibility of just being able to compose with any other contract that's being deployed uh, and enforce atomic operations across those contracts. 
So we could call it Tezos broadband moments. You know, it's a difference between the dial-up, where you can go to a few websites and you can get some information, you can read a few things online, to broadband, where the web stops being just an information content delivery and become an application content delivery, where essentially the browser has replaced the operating system as a way to deliver applications today. You know, you very rarely now, unless for like some very, very specific like um, resource-heavy applications, really do you imply install applications on a, on a computer anymore? It's, it's all on the internet. So the way that the internet shifted from just content to applications, I we can see a radical shift um, in blockchains in the same way in terms of the application that it supports. Um, if you give them this support, if you give them the ability to use all these languages, if you give them all this throughput. So what does this mean in practice for, um, for users and developers? So again, going in the old paradigm of blockchain, I would say censorship resistance is a bread and butter. Why is that? Well, that's why they were invented for. You know, the whole point of um, the invention of Bitcoin is you want to have a decentralized cryptocurrency, and it needs to be censorship resilient, and it needs to be very, very resistant because people are going to try to corrupt it. And that comes at the time with those systems with a huge cost. Right? There's a huge cost in running those systems. They're slow, they have high latency, and whenever people have tried to build you know, applications, I would say a very, very good rule of thumb to know if a good applica an application was good for a blockchain was like, does this actually need censorship resistance? Are there nation states colluding around the world to stop it? And if not, why on earth are you paying the cost of being on a blockchain? It, 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 it's a huge cost. It doesn't have that much advantages compared to a centralized database. So why would you, why would you pay that cost? But if you reduce the cost, if the cost becomes minimal, if basically you are within maybe one order of magnitude, you know, a factor of like three, let's say, or four from cloud cost, then it becomes very different. Then that question goes away. Then it's like, well, you know, maybe I don't strictly care about the you know, resistance, but I care about convenience. I care about the fact that payments are natively supported. I care about the fact that people are already onboarded. Um, I care about the fact that they have their identity. I care about the fact that I don't necessarily have to pay the bills uh, for a server, right? Um, it can be paid by customers directly. So there's a lot of like small but benefits that completely add up. And if you can get the cost low enough, it truly transforms the type of applications that can be built and that can be deployed on the systems. And so mainstream programming languages is, I think, a super important piece of that. Um, they're used by tens of millions of developers, not tens of thousands. They have better documentation, better tooling, way more libraries, way more educational material. And also, and that's, I think it's, you know, there's a ton of absolutely meaningless drivel and, you know, like drivel hype around uh, AI and blockchain. That doesn't make sense. But I will say this, AI systems are very, very good you know, they're getting very, very good at coding, and they're much better at coding when they have large corpuses. So they are better programmers of Python and JavaScript than they are of uh, smaller languages. And so the pressure, you know, everything that I said about the benefits of using JavaScript and Python is going to keep increasing and increasing as much more and more code is being built by AI. So that, I think, is a, like, one of the most important reasons for moving to those languages is uh, the the tooling is getting so much better and so much more important. Um, so because supports matter, we're starting with JavaScript uh, to open Tezos to tens of millions of builders. And when I say um, JavaScript, so right now, the project to do it is Justice. And you mentioned, you, you see, I mentioned a few projects, Etherlink, Justice. Right now, we have a few initiatives. And the goal is for those to coalesce into this big project that is Tezos X. So JSTZ, pronounced Justice, is an experimental rollup that you can try with a JavaScript execution environment. Um, it has a web-like interfaces between contracts, so talking to another contract feels like making a call to a web, web server, um, except you know, with atomicity and without the latency and all of that. You can try it now. There's a link and there's a QR code. If you're a developer, please um, try GSTZ and let us know what you think. Um, one thing, uh, real JavaScript hasn't been tried, so you've probably heard of like, oh yeah, but you know, didn't it try JavaScript in that project and that project and that project? So, yeah, I wonder because I thought, like, look, JavaScript would be huge. We need to do it, but you know, didn't they do it in? Uh, didn't they do it in like way back in what was it called, like links or something like that? No, no, they only supported like a few contracts, and you had to do governance to modify it. Didn't they try it in near? No, your contract had to carry the entire interpreter with you. So like every single blockchain that has done like JS, there's always like a little fine print. Um, it's not full support. We're going for full support of JavaScript uh, without the caveat, without the fine print. So JavaScript, Python, Mikkelsen, all this VM, all in one big rollup, cheap, fast, 
always on with easy integration to existing code, a lot more on-chain logic, uh, allowing millions of users to have real-time experiences. Thank you.